Good morning, everyone. Good morning. For those of you who are here in person, we want to extend a warm word of welcome to each and every one of you. And for those who may be visiting us, a special word of welcome. We hope your time with us is filled with enrichment and renewal. For those joining us either by live stream through Facebook or YouTube or on KINA Radio, 910 AM, 107.5 FM, welcome to you as well as we come together as a people of faith to worship and glorify God. If you'd care to follow along in your live streaming, you can go to our website, fpcsalina.org, and download the bulletin, which will allow you to have a little, a feeling of being a little more connected to us. We are in the midst of our stewardship season, and you'll be hearing in a little bit some of the ministries that you as a congregation have been supporting within Salina over these past years. But I hope what you will be doing throughout this season of stewardship is taking a moment to do a personal assessment, to assess how God has touched your lives over the past year, two years, lifetime, and then respond accordingly. So with all of that in mind, let us respond accordingly as we come together as a people of faith with our opening sentences. Would you please stand if you are able? Who may abide in the presence of God? Who may live on God's holy mountain? All those who walk blamelessly and do what is right all those who speak truth from their heart. Please join us in the opening hymn, number 451, Open My Eyes That I May See. Please be seated. 
let us now with sincere hearts and minds confess our sins before God and the world, trusting in God's mercy and forgiveness. Please join me in our prayer of confession printed in the bulletin. God of light, we confess that we live in the shadows of hypocrisy and self-righteousness. We honor you with our lips, but we have not served you in our hearts. We are satisfied with human traditions and norms and avoid your liberating truth. We have confused meekness with weakness, holiness with social conformity, and anger with righteousness. Forgive us, we pray. By the power of your word, save us from the prison of our conceit, so that we may serve you with sincere hearts through Jesus Christ our Lord. Amen. God renews and refreshes us by the word of faith that we might become the first fruits of God's creation. I want you to know this. I want you to take this in and believe this. For friends, in Jesus Christ, you have been forgiven. Thanks be to God. Amen. Hallelujah. guys, welcome this morning. Um, when I was preparing to talk to you today, um, I came across a great story that I want to share with you that kind of explains the scripture kind of in language that we might all be able to understand. This story is not my writing, it's actually written by Gary Neal Hansen, and he wrote the story to help us understand better the scripture for today. In school, we would probably call this story historical fiction, meaning that it's based on real events that happened in the Bible, but some of the story is made up. In this story, like in today's scripture, Jesus teaches his disciples about what it means to be the greatest. Now, he isn't talking about what it means to be the greatest swimmer or the greatest football player. He's talking about what it takes to be great at serving God. Here is the start of the story. One time, Jesus and his friends were walking along the road. They had been teaching and healing people and helping people all through the towns of Galilee. Oh, man, said Peter. I'm so glad we're finally heading home. I can't wait to get back to Caper Capernaum. Me too, said Jesus. It's been a good trip, though. Hey, Jesus, said John. I think there's another village coming up. Do you want me to run ahead and tell them that we're coming? Thanks, John, said Jesus, but no. We're going to skip that one for today. I really don't want anybody to know that I'm here. How come, John asked. I have something very important to talk with you all about. Come on, he called out. Everybody come closer so you can hear. Well, it took a couple minutes to get everybody organized. Then they started walking again, and Jesus started talking. I want to make sure all of you understand what's going to be happening, he said. We're going to head up to Jerusalem soon. 
and then it's going to get kind of scary. They are going to arrest me. A bunch of people are going to start accusing me of doing bad things. What did you do, asked Nathaniel. Was it something really bad? I didn't do anything wrong, Nathaniel, Jesus said. But they are going to make accusations. Then soldiers are going to beat me and hurt me. And eventually, they are going to kill me. But that won't be the end. I'm going to come back alive again. Well, by this time, the disciples were sort of drifting away down the road. Didn't Jesus already tell us that, asked John? Yeah, said Mary, a couple times, actually. I told him to stop it the other day, said Peter. Yeah, I heard that, said Nathaniel. I'm thinking that didn't go so well for you. And he started laughing at Peter. Hey, said Peter, what gives you the right to laugh at me? Everybody knows I'm the most important disciple. Jesus likes me best. Biggest mouth disciple is more like it, Nathaniel said. Well, Jesus said, I'm the rock, Peter said. He said he's going to build the whole church on the base of my faith. Peter looked pretty smug when he said that. Oh, yeah, said Nathaniel, kind of sneering. Well, Jesus said, I'm an Israelite with no guile. What's that mean? John asked Mary. It means he says whatever comes into his head, said Mary, even if it's kind of dumb. No, said Nathaniel. It means I'm the most important disciple. Jesus likes me best. Um, no, said John. I don't think so. Everybody says I'm the disciple Jesus really loves. That makes me the most important disciple. Hey, you guys, said Mary. Don't forget how Jesus said I was the one who made the very best choice. Remember? It was that night when we had dinner at my house, and I sat at his feet to listen and learn. I'd say that makes me the most important disciple. Plus, he always comes over to my house. More important than your sister Martha, maybe, said Peter, but not most important of all. Well, we'll spare you the rest of the argument. They bickered about it all the way back to Jesus' house in Caper Capernaum. Once they were finally inside, Jesus said, So what were you all talking about on the way back here? Peter, John, Nathaniel, and Mary all sort of looked down at their feet or up at the ceiling, not at Jesus. Oh, nothing, somebody mumbled. Okay, well, that's good, Jesus said. Hey, I wanted to tell you all something really important. We know, we know, moaned Nathaniel. You're going to get arrested and hurt and killed. No, not that, said Jesus. I already told you about that. No, I wanted to tell you who I think is the most important disciple. They all sort of looked up. John smiled. You mean the one you like the best? Well, said Jesus, I wasn't going to put it quite like that. But here's the deal. If you want to be the very most important disciple, you have to be more helpful than everybody else. Like take the jobs a servant would do, clean up after others, wash people's feet when they need it, and other stuff. Yuck, said Nathaniel. I was right about you, Nathaniel, said Jesus. No guile. Just then, a little girl came running in. She lived next door, and she just loved playing with Jesus. Jesus, she cried, you're back. And she threw herself into his arms and gave him a great big hug. I miss you so much, she said. Don't ever go away again. Peter said, um, little girl, we're talking about grown-ups things here, and I think maybe you should go home. But Jesus just hugged the girl and then turned her around so everyone could see her. Listen up, everybody. Here is an example of doing what's really helpful. Say you welcome one little kid because you know that kids, the kid belongs to me. When you, well, then really, you'll be welcoming me. And if you welcome me, then really, you're welcoming my father, God. And he said to the little girl, let's go play. And they did. Now that's the end of that story. You see, at the time of Jesus, 
Children weren't seen as, as, as important as they are today. In fact, they saw children as the weakest of all of society. They weren't valued members of society because they couldn't do much and they had to be taken care of. People saw them as a liability. Jesus used the child to teach the lesson he wanted the disciples to learn. He wanted them to learn that in order to be great disciples, they should welcome and serve those who are last. In taking care of those with the least, we are welcoming God. With that, let's pray, please. Dear God, thank you for sending us Jesus. Help us be more Christ-like by welcoming and caring for those who need it the most. Help us see God in those who are alone and in need. Amen. Good morning. It is a true pleasure for me to introduce Andy Holtberg. Uh, Andy's been the executive director at Ashby House since 2017. Over the past 20 years, he has experience working with nonprofit organizations and faith communities. Much of his time has been dedicated to creating and implementing initiatives and programs that support individuals and their families facing tremendous hardship, including issues of substance abuse, poverty, death, and dying, homelessness, incarceration, and spiritual and emotional crisis. Andy went to South Middle School, graduated from Salina South in 1995. He said he married his high school sweetheart, and they have three beautiful children. So please welcome Andy Holtberg. Well, good morning. How y'all doing today? Good. We're very excited to be here again. I think I was here uh, last year, and then I got to hang out with the youth for a bit. Uh, It was a lot of fun. Got to know Keith, Pastor Keith, and miss him very dearly. He became a very close friend of mine, and we stay in touch still. Um, We are so grateful. On behalf of Ashby House, just want to extend our our gratitude for the many years of uh, support that First Presbyterian has given us. Over the years together, we have helped thousands of women and families find stability, uh, find freedom, find hope, um, and find a place uh, where they could call their own uh, home of their own. Ashby House exists to help uh, restore hope to individuals and families facing homelessness and housing instability by breaking, helping break the cycle of poverty and addiction. And we do this really through our supportive housing um, um, programs. We have our homeless shelter, uh, which brings in folks that don't have anywhere else to go, um, and in our substance use program, which is a partnership with CKF, Central Kansas Foundation, and then transitional housing. And all three of these programs, we call them supportive because we are walking alongside people uh, to help them uh, find uh, you know, freedom from, from addiction, freedom from issues of poverty, freedom and, and support that they need. Uh, we'd have everything from parenting classes to budgeting and financial literacy, uh, as well as we su- help subsidize them with clothing and food. And so really it's, it's just us coming alongside people and finding, helping them find the courage and strength that they already possess within them. Uh, so we always tell people we don't give dignity We just affirm dignity. God has already given those individuals dignity. We come alongside them and just remind them of that through our help. And so we've been doing this for, you know, almost 30 years now. And it's it's amazing to see and hear the stories of success. Uh, And I wish there were more. I wish we could say that every single person who walks through our doors, we're able to help them find that freedom and hope. Um, But um, unfortunately, it doesn't always work out that way. Just last year, we started a new program, and um, I'm, a, I'm a minister myself, and over the years, you know, I know churches get a lot of requests for funds uh, through, uh, and, and don't always have the time to follow up with people in the community uh, to make sure that they're getting the help they need, making sure that those needs are legitimate. Um, and then also, we also started noticing a pattern when talking with pastors that 
People were going from five to six different places in a day looking for funds to help with bills because they couldn't. And, and if you can imagine being a single mother with toting three kids along, uh, going from five or six different places and some places getting de you know, denied, um, it would be very difficult and you get very disappointed. And so we started partnering sh with other churches in the community and started a program called Love Salina. Uh, and this is a wonderful program. Some of you are probably familiar with it. I think Pastor Wes of, uh, of the Covenant Church came by and told you all about it. But there are eight different churches in this community, including First Presbyterian, who have donated to uh, some of their benevolent funds. Um, and then K Ashby House comes alongside and provides um, the case management. So when people need you know, rent assistance, and they call, and they might owe $350, $400. There's nowhere in Salina that you can get that much money um, before, and, and then what ends up happening is you end up uh, being evicted. Uh, and so we have a one-stop place where people can get referred to, and we have case managers and volunteers as well that walk alongside people and help them find all the resources in town, and then we have funds that the churches have given, the churches have given that we can kind of help. Um, one of the, so many amazing stories uh, have come through this program. Um, we helped a teenage, uh, uh, a single uh, a, a girl, a woman who was in, still in high school and still working, and she had a young infant child, and her windshield had been broken out, and so she was unable to get to work. Well, through Love Salina, we were able to replace that windshield and get her along. But my, one of the more memorable ones, uh, stories for me, and this is what I want to end on, is a story of a, of, a, of a daughter who moved to Salina to help her terminally ill mother, uh, who was just about ready to be evicted. And so she moved in, she got a job at a local retail store, but she was, there was a gap between when she was going to get her first paycheck. So her terminally ill mother was just about ready to be put out on the streets um, and she, she was referred to us by a church. And she came to us. She had never taken advantage of any kind of system like this before of help. Um, but she was able to get the help she needed through Love Salina because of contributing churches like First Presby Presbyterian. And we were able to keep her in her home with her mother. And she was able to have that her last few moments uh, uh, on earth stress-free from being kicked out onto the streets. And so those are stories, especially during the pandemic, that have come up over and over again. People who normally don't seek for assistance um, are looking for it for the first time. And uh, we've been able to really help a lot. So far, we've helped over 200 people and raised over $64,000 in just under a year of this program's existence. So thank you from the bottom of our heart. You really are helping make uh, this community a much stronger community because of your benevolence. So thank you for putting your faith in action. like to say a quick word about this morning's anthem. Um, the title, Better is One Day, um, kind of came to me on the idea, actually, uh, as I read through the bulletin and saw the opening sentences. Uh, actually, the first question, who may abide in the presence of God? And right off the bat, for some reason, who knows why ever with these things, uh, Psalm 84 just popped into my head. Um, for those of you who don't have Psalm 84 right at the tip of your brain. I'll just read a couple of lines from it. How lovely is your dwelling place, O Lord of hosts. My song longs, indeed, my soul longs, indeed it faints for the courts of the Lord. My heart and my flesh sing for joy to the living God. Happy are those who live in your house, ever singing your praise. For a day in your courts is better than a thousand elsewhere. Uh, that's sort of a Cliff Notes version. It's not the entire psalm, but it gives you uh, a little background for the piece you're going to hear, Better is One Day.
This is the prayer for illumination. Let us pray. Lord, by the power of your spirit, open our hearts and minds to receive your word that we not forget the wonders you have done, nor neglect to make them known to our children, nor fail to tell them to the world. Amen. The scripture reading today is from Mark, chapter 9, verses 30 through 37. And if you've already heard from Heidi, there's some bickering going on. Jesus and the disciples went on from there and passed through Galilee. Jesus did not want anyone to know it, for he was teaching his disciples, saying to them, the Son of Man is to be betrayed into human hands, and they will kill him, and three days after being killed, he will rise again. But they did not understand what he was saying, and they were afraid to ask him. Then they came to Capernaum, and when he was in the house, he asked them, What were you arguing about on the way? But they were silent, for on the way they had argued with one another about who was the greatest. He sat down, called the twelve, and said to them, Whoever wants to be first must be last of all and servant of all. Then he took a little child and put it among them, and taking it in his arms, he said to them, Whoever welcomes one such child in my name welcomes me, and whoever welcomes me welcomes not me, but the one who sent me. This is the word of the Lord. Thanks Thanks be be to God. God.
There is a little ditty that I recall being told as a young boy. And for some reason it stuck with me. And maybe you know this and have laughed about it as well. But it goes something like this. Little boys grow up to be big boys with bigger toys. Now remember that throughout this sermon. Because I think it's one of the threads, though it may not be very theological, that connects these stories that are before us. I like to think that Jesus said something like that in light of everything that was going on throughout this lesson. That's why he didn't want anyone to know that he was in that area. He wanted to use, if you will, some stealth maneuvers because he wanted to go about his business without the public interrupting him. He wanted his disciples to learn a very important lesson. He was basically saying, this is a teaching moment. Listen, for the Son of Man is going to be betrayed and then executed, but three days later, he's going to rise again. Hearing that, though, was confounding, to say the least, to the disciples who were listening to him. It was beyond their comprehension. It was more than they could handle. Talking about him being executed and then rising again. Now we may think we understand all of this, but the fact of the matter is we have the privilege of seeing all of the scriptures through the lens of resurrection. And Jesus, as the Christ, knows this. It helps us to somewhat catch a glimpse of what he's trying to tell us. Yet, I think at the same time, it hinders us from grasping the full extent of what he's trying to convey to those novice ears that he was speaking to on that road, in that home. This is why Jesus later on, I think, goes to a child and uses that child to help with the earlier lesson he was trying to teach his disciples. All of this is to say, in my opinion, that it reminds me that we are on a faith continuum here. A faith continu continuum where our faith grows and deepens in imperceptible ways one step at a time. You see, our faith journey takes us at a pace evolving as we grow into it, evolving in very deliberate ways. And it's at this pace that we're allowed to become encouraged to be proactive seekers, seeking to understand what Jesus is trying to convey to us, rather than being what we often are, inactive or even passive recipients of the word being shared with us. Each of us, I understand, progresses at our own pace. We progress at our own pace in our faith journey because that is the way we have chosen 
to learn. Now, this has been seen in many different ways over the past years and the past centuries. Our desert fathers and mothers were students of this. They understood that it took time, years as a matter of fact, to truly comprehend what Christ was trying to tell them and what Christ is trying to tell us. And yet, we think we don't need to be so immersed in our faith. We don't need to delve deeper into what we believe. We should be able to get it right away. We should be able to understand it and move forward immediately and declare ourselves to be faithful followers of Jesus Christ, disciples of our Lord. But let me get back to the story. These disciples here had been with Jesus for a good bit of time up to this point. They were strong individuals. But when they were confronted with some of these deeper questions, they were afraid to even raise a question. They were uncertain of where their faith was. They weren't sure about whether they were to dive deeper into their faith because they were fearful of where it would lead them. My friends, it doesn't matter what our cultural backgrounds are. It doesn't matter what our chronological ages may be or educational backgrounds and experiences are. Our spiritual maturity is a choice. It's dependent on us. It's our choice, our option, as to how deep we wish to go in our faith journey in order to have it exposed to us and in order for us to respond in kind. All of us, the disciples, you and me, come to the table of our faith continuum from different places, from different perspectives, at different paces but I hope we are all progressing as only we can do so with our hands out, our minds open, our hearts exposed to what Jesus is calling us to be and to do. Sadly, though, I think sometimes our immaturity shows itself just as it did with the disciples. And Jesus has to take us back to a very simple analogy in order to show us who we are to be. That's what happened when they were arguing. I'm the best. No, I'm number one. No, he looks out for me, looks to me first. Oh my goodness. Boys will be boys, won't we? We so want to be number one in a group of one or more. Daddy likes me more than you. Grown men competing for attention. Does that sound familiar? Aging is mandatory. but maturity is optional. When Albert Einstein first came to Princeton University in the 1940s, he was given one of the finest home, faculty homes off Nassau Street. It had everything and then some. 
It had a big parlor for him to entertain. It had lined bookshelves in his office from floor to ceiling. It had a magnificent desk to work at. And it had a magnificent private garden out back for him to entertain. The faculty begrudgingly allowed it. After all, yes, it was Einstein. Now, when he died in his sleep in 1955, the president of the university called all the faculty together. And that, at that assembly, he informed them of Einstein's passing. You can only imagine, there was deep silence. A little coughing then. And then from the back, a cough and a raspy voice called out a question. Who gets his house? Disciples. The disciples were normal, flawed, uncertain, scared people who couldn't understand everything that Jesus was putting before them. Even after a teaching moment. But they chose to stay with him. They chose to learn from him. They chose to grow their faith as they listened to him. They chose to be his disciples. Taking these teaching moments and learning, developing their faith as they spoke with one another and with Jesus and listened to him, they were maturing in their faith because they understood what it took to be a disciple of this Jesus from Nazareth. Many times, as you know, answers don't come immediately. And sometimes we take the most circuitous route to get to our final destination. But then there are also times when we have, if you will, heart-to-heart -heart talks with ourselves and with others. And we come to realize, maybe in a split-second moment, as it all falls together, we come to realize what it means to be a disciple of Jesus Christ. And the last is who will be first. The most vulnerable will be those that we are to reach out to. They are to be put in front of us because they are the most important vulnerable individuals. This is what Maturity means. For when we have a mature faith, we're made more aware, we're made more conscious of, we're made more sympathetic and empathetic to those who have been struggling, those who have been hurting, those who have been wondering, does anybody care? And when we do that, we take on a new skin, if you will, a skin of hope, a skin of compassion, a skin of mercy, a skin of faith, a skin of discipleship. And that's when we realize, that's when we realize 
what it means to have a mature faith in Jesus Christ. Amen. 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 Let us pray. Sometimes we see faith, O Lord, as a grand mystery. But maybe that is because we make it so. Sometimes it's right there before us. And we have clouded our own vision. We have confused our own minds. We have sought to look elsewhere because it scares us. And yet, it's there that we find comfort and peace, hope and reassurance. It's there where everything is illuminated for us and allows us to say, we are your humble servants. In Christ Jesus we pray. Amen. Would you please stand now as we affirm our faith using these words from the Westminster Shorter Catechism. The Westminster Shorter Catechism has, over, has 107 questions and answers. And this one that we'll be reading comes from question number 21, which says, Who is the Redeemer of God's elect? And our response is, The only Redeemer of God's elect is the Lord Jesus Christ, who being the eternal Son of God, became human, and so was, and continues to be God and humankind, in two distinctive natures, and one person forever. And now let us remain standing as we join together in singing the church's one foundation, hymn number 321, 321.
Just a few notes to share with you. Please look on the back of your bulletin for the calendar of events for this coming week and mark those that pertain to you. We started our midweek ministries to the children's education known here as FBI and FBI in training this past Wednesday at 345 and we will continue this coming week starting at 345. And then right after that at 515 we will have our midweek manna which is a worship experience that includes in that time a time of fellowship, a meal, and conversation. So please feel free to come and join us. It's open to one and to all for a little food, a little fellowship, and a little fun. Please also note the announcement dealing with social justice and mission who are now preparing to uh, have a community coat drive uh, in the not too distant future. So please make note of that. This is a collaborative effort on our part with Sunrise Presbyterian Church. More information will be coming out in the weeks ahead. And the, there is a women's Bible study which is getting ready to start on October 11th. So please make note of that if you have any questions or would like to uh, purchase the material for that which is called What My Grandmother Taught Me you can call the church office. So now, let us join together in prayer. And throughout this prayer, there will be a few brief moments of silence, specifically to allow you that opportunity to lift up your own petitions and prayers of intercession. Let us pray. Almighty God, we pray that you will bless this church. Deliver us from self-righteousness and make us holy in every way. That all your people may see you in the witness of your faithful servants. For all who serve you, we pray you will hear our prayer. Bless the leadership of this congregation, O Lord, the elders its deacons, trustees, and staff, and all who minister in your name. Give them the wisdom to discern your truth, to honor your commandments, and to deal with humility as they lead in the same manner. Let them walk blamelessly, do what is right, and speak truth from their heart. We also pray for your world and its leaders. May nations understand their role, O Lord, for they are to seek to guide and care for their people. Give them sound judgment and merciful hearts. Help them be accountable for the common good. Save them from the cynicism of war and violence. Free them from the influence of greed. Deliver them from the temptations of social power. Almighty God, for your community, whether it be a church or secular community, hear our prayer. Mighty God, bless your children those who care for them, and those who protect them. Give them what they need to grow in body, mind, and spirit, and provide caring adults that will model for them a life of purpose, of compassion, of kindness, of hope, mercy, and love. For the sick and those in distress, for those hurting and, un and are unsure of their futures, we pray you will hear our prayer, O Lord. Mighty God, bless those who face the rep reproach of society, those in prison, whether innocent or guilty, 
those who are ostracized due to mental illness, those who hunger for compassion and hope, those who seek shelter, and those who fear being made homeless, those who are lost to addiction, those who feel as though nothing is going their way. O oh Lord, surround them with compassion and save them from hopelessness. For these are our prayers that we lift up to you, God of light, as we step toward you, our Lord and our Savior, with words that you gave to us when praying, saying in one voice, Our Father, who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done, on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread, and forgive us our debts as we forgive our debtors. And lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. For thine is the kingdom, and the power, and the glory forever. Amen. Please sign the fellowship pads that are found in each pew and pass them to your neighbors. Your support of the ministry and mission of First Presbyterian Church touches every corner of the world. You can give in a variety of ways, placing your offering in the offering plates at the back of the sanctuary, or by following instructions in your bulletins for sending your offering by postal mail, text message, website, or the Realm app. So let us give thanks to our God as we present our offerings to the Lord. May God put to good use what we give this day. God, receive these gifts for the work of your church. With these gifts, we dedicate ourselves to live in the truth of your word and follow your commandments with sincere hearts. Through Christ our Lord, amen. amen. Our sending hymn is number 738. O Master, let me walk with thee. And is it one through four or just one, one and, and four? One and four. So verses one and four. <laughs> So today, as you go out from here into the beauty of this lovely day, I ask you to remember 
what it is you're being asked to be, a disciple of Jesus Christ. It's not an easy journey. It's a journey that takes time. It's a journey that requires you to make some choices. It's a journey of hope, a journey of faith. But once you make that decision, the world will open up to you and you will see it like never before. So go out, take a hold of this day and know that you do so in the name of God who loves you, in the name of Jesus Christ who cares about you, in the name of the Holy Spirit that supports you this day and always. Go in peace. Shalom.